Thank you for joining us today. My name is Blake Graham, and I will be facilitating the program this afternoon. I'm one of the three archivists who uh, collect, preserve, and provide access to the history of Douglas County at the Douglas County History Research Center of Douglas County Libraries. The Where Do You Think You Are program has been a joint, joint venture between the Douglas County History Research Center, Highlands Ranch Historical Society, and Historic Douglas County, Inc. This program was created to facilitate lively discussions throughout the year on the history, identity, and current developments of towns and areas across Douglas County. So, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our panelists. And can everyone can everyone hear me okay? Is the sound okay? Um, I'll start with Terry Nolan in the center. Terry Nolan has served as general manager of the Highlands Ranch Metro District for nearly 20 years. As general manager, Terry, is, Terry works for the organization's elected board of directors, leads the 82-person Metro District staff, and is responsible for the efficient management of many community services provided by this local government organization. During the last two decades, Terry has overseen the addition of many community amenities including Civic Green Park and Redstone Park, consolidation of the districts, renovation of the historic Highlands Ranch Mansion, all while maintaining a stable property tax. I think we can all appreciate that. <laughs> he also has served 26 years in the military, um, in the Navy, flying 159 combat missions in Vietnam. For both your service to our country and our community, we're very grateful to have you with us today, Terry. To the left of Terry is David Johnson. David grew up just north of Highlands Ranch and has watched it transform from fields of antelope to the planned community it is today. David has been the Highlands Ranch Historical has been with the Highlands Ranch Historical Society for many years and is recognized as the HRHS historian. David is also a member of the Douglas County Historic Preservation Board that works to identify historic landmarks across our entire county. He is currently working on a book about the history of Highlands Ranch as depicted through photographs. For over 13 years, David has enjoyed raising his family in Highlands Ranch and looks forward to continuing his contributions to the community. David, thank you for all your efforts and for bringing your breadth of knowledge to the table with us today. And I'm going to jump back closest to me, uh, Ken Joseph. Ken is the Operations, Operations and Programs Director for the Highlands Ranch Community Association, recognized as one of the largest top-tier community associations in the U.S., employing over 800 people in our area. The HRCA serves 30,000 households and nearly 100,000 residents. Kim directs the day-to-day -day operations and facility management, which includes four state-of-the-art recreation centers, which I personally love, um, <laughs> recreation properties, and a vast assortment of year-round classes, camps, leagues, programs, and activities that serve our entire, the entire Highlands Ranch community. Kim, we greatly appreciate your work with HRCA, and thank you for joining us today for the program. <laughs> Justin Vaughn. To, to the media, to the far left, um, was admitted to uh, practice law in 1994. Uh, Justin established his own firm in 2000 here, right here in the area, and he has continued to provide services in the full range in a full range of legal matters. Justin currently serves as chair elect for the board of directors of the Highlands Ranch Chamber of Commerce, and he also serves on the advisory board for the South Metro Denver Chamber of Commerce. He's a, board, he's a board member on the Douglas County Business Alliance and is a primary benefactor for the Highlands Ranch Rotary. Justin has a wide range of roles in the community and contributions to Highlands Ranch, and it's a privilege to have you here with us today, Justin. And just a small uh, comment about how we're going to progress through the program. Um, this is going to be a conversation. Uh, we have a panel of amazing members of our community here to answer your most burning questions about why Highlands Ranch is the way it is. I have a few here myself 
that I'm going to get us going with. But I want you to play a part in this. Because this is ultimately for you. So to keep everything orderly, I do ask that you raise, raise a hand when it's time for the next question, and that the questions, the questions themselves be thoughtful and concise. We're all here to learn. So, I'm curious, just a lighthearted uh, question, why Highlands Ranch? Um, how did the community come to be known as that? Yeah, I have a story. Yeah, I have a story. Yeah, well, Highlands Ranch has a long history, and as I guess I need the microphone. <laughs> Go ahead, need the microphone. Uh, Highlands Ranch has a. Oh, turn on. Hello? Ranch has a long history in a lot of northern Douglas County, starting back with uh, homesteads throughout this whole area. So when you get to the very beginning, most of this area started as uh, 40 to 160 acre homesteads. Uh, what most of the people found was that wasn't quite enough land to raise cattle in this area, where uh, the grasses aren't quite like they are back east, so you need more land for, uh, to raise cattle and stuff. Uh, so you start with the homesteads. Uh, the first one... Uh, in this area was, I just saw it, it was 19, I can't remember if it was 59 or 69, but it was Dad Clark, which is up where the Highlands Ranch Golf Course is. Uh, he started farming potatoes up in that area, and that was the very first one. The main ones that we get around here uh, was starting before the mansion is, which is the gem of Highlands Ranch history and kind of the core of where Highlands Ranch history began. And that started in the 1880s with Samuel Long. Uh, from there, went through a whole bunch of uh, different owners, a lot of which are uh, respected and uh, known throughout the community. Uh, you had Long that went to Springer, who actually ran for uh, mayor of Denver, uh, ended up losing that election, uh, was even a, was a finalist for the vice presidential nomination for the U.S., but that also did uh, come through for him. And then uh, got into a scandal with his wife in 1911 and fell out of politics. Uh, passed it on to uh, Wade Phipps, uh, the brother of the guy, or Phillips, the brother of the guy that started Phillips Petroleum, uh, the brothers that started Phillips Petroleum, and he was the first one that gave it the name that we're talking about. He called it Highland Ranch. Didn't have the S on it, but he was close. So that's where the name started. Uh, went around, uh, he sold it. Uh, sold it off to the Kisslers, who finished up the, the building of the mansion as it, it was historically known. Uh, and then from there, they sold it to the Phipps, who owned it for many years and brought the name back to Highlands Ranch. And so that is where the name Highlands Ranch came. Uh, then he died in 18, or 1976, and uh, Marvin Davis, uh, billionaire oil man, picked it up, turned it over, and sold it off to what well, at that time was Mission Viejo, which has later been sold into Shea Homes. And that is the Highlands Ranch we have today. Thank you, David. Um, and I'm also curious to know, this is, uh, if we can go just kind of a round robin, if, if this would be appropriate. Um, as a few of the recognized leaders in the community, you've played a role in shaping the identity of Highlands Ranch. Could you share a personal or professional project or effort that you're proud of that some people here may not be aware of? <laughs> Make our round robin is going back. Thanks, Jerry. Thanks, Jerry. Um, one project that we're very, very proud of at the HRCA is our energy saving project. And we've been working very, very hard for years to, uh, I guess, not be energy independent, but as energy independent as we can be. And we started that off um, many years ago. Yes, Sarah? Could we turn the mic up a little bit? I'm working on it. Okay, I'll, I'll, ta I'll talk a little louder okay. at, at the same time. Sure. Oh, there it goes. There it goes. Um, but, but we've been working, like, in terms of replacing our energy inefficient lighting with energy efficient lighting. And fortunately, 
uh, the technology and lighting changes rapidly and is improving. About every five years, we, we see some significant improvements. So a couple years ago, our delegates approved uh, a 2.6 million energy saving project, which, which we hired a company called McKinstry to come in and help us with that because they're, they're, they have a number of high-level engineers that, that uh, uh, understand everything there is to know about about all of our operating equipment. So we were able to replace a lot of our operating equipment. Um, we, we retrofitted a lot of our uh, sinks, toilets, uh, urinals, things like that. We, we changed out our oldest, oldest uh, air handling units that handle the air for our pools. Um, and uh, uh, as a result of that, um, we were able to get $141,000 worth of uh, rebates from Excel Energy, which, which really helped the project a whole lot. Um, also, we were participating in a, a, a program through the state of Colorado um, where our energy savings are guaranteed. And our energy savings are guaranteed at the rate of $163,000 per year. Um, so, and I'm, and I'm kind of talking in dollars instead of um, environment, but this this very much uh, benefits the environment. Um, besides besides saving all the residents of Highlands Ranch um, energy dollars, so we're we're uh, tracking right now um, through pr preliminary verification at about one hundred seventy three thousand dollars per year. So we're very proud of that project, and we're going to continue uh, to to work in that area and and get as energy independent as we possibly can. So that's the one project, the, the recent project we've been working on. Thank you, Captain Terry. That's awesome. That's good stuff. Um, so I've been here since 1996, and uh, there were 33,000 people in the community at the time, and now we're over 90. So you can imagine there's lots of things that have occurred over those years. Uh, so it's kind of hard to pick a few out, but I will, since we asked me to. Civic Green Park, we like, to, we like to think of it as the heart of Highlands Ranch. It's kind of in the middle, and it's a gathering place, and it has the Case Pavilion, and there's all kinds of events that occur there. The interactive stream and fountains are very popular. Um, it's just a, a great location for kind of the middle of the community, and I'm really proud of that project, and not only that, it includes the Veterans Monument. And if you haven't been to the Veterans Monument, just take a few minutes after you're done here and go out and walk through that. It's pretty, pretty moving for me anyway. And our partners on this have been the library in Douglas County. We actually, part of the park is built on library land and we worked really well with them together. We have a Veterans Day event here. Lisa Casper helps us with that every year upstairs. <laughs> it's cold in November, so we like to do that indoors. We have done a few outdoors, but the Heart of Islands Ranch is what we like to call it, Civic Green Park. I, I can't give the mic over without mentioning what we also consider the soul of the ranch, and that's the Historic Park and Mansion. I mean, I am so proud of that project, and, and the credit to Shea, who gave us the land, and the building, and the money, and, uh, and to turn that into a wonderful historical asset. If you haven't been there, you must go there. Tuesdays and Thursdays, 9 to 2, and occasionally a Monday evening. Or an event, we're having events there every now and then. Um, that's about a $6 million renovation. And we're operating the mansion without the use of tax dollars. We rent it out for private events. So your tax dollars don't go to that fabulous facility that we have up there. There's lots more, but I'll hold it there. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Terry. Uh, well, seeing as I volunteered, it's not my full-time job. I don't have a major project like that. But there's a lot of things that with the Historical Society that I'm very proud of. The fact that every Monday, or every third Monday, down South Ridge, we get together and share history with people. And I think that that's important to keep our history alive. And I know, part of, you may have mentioned that we're, as the Historical Society, we're working on a book and we're trying to capture images of Highlands Ranch, both historic uh, from its early days and even from today. And to get all that into a book to capture that for the future generations. I know I'm raising my daughter and she was actually born here in Highlands Ranch, so this is the only hometown she's ever known. So, 
I'm a little like Terry. It's hard for me to sit and talk at the same time. So at some point, we'll reach a consensus on whether we're standing or sitting. <laughs> The, um, uh, I'm here on behalf of the Highlands Ranch Chamber, so I'll, uh, I'll respond in that regard. Uh, the, uh, with regard to things that people typically know about, certainly we are a Chamber of Commerce. We assist with business networking. We assist with uh, business development and have business development programs. We communicate with businesses that are uh, e either uh, being born in Highlands Ranch or considering relocating to Highlands Ranch. <coughs> But one of the things that you may not know about uh, is the extent to which we are involved in legislative efforts as well. The Chamber does participate, and I am the representative of the Highlands Ranch Chamber on the Douglas County Business Alliance. Uh, we do engage in lobbying efforts down at the legislature, uh, and we do our best to make sure that the legislature does not do things that interfere with the quality of education in Highlands Ranch, with the uh, tax rates that we appreciate in Highlands Ranch. Uh, and, and all of the activities that uh, go on at the legislature that sometimes make us smile and nod and sometimes make us shake our head in disbelief. So that's one of the activities of the chamber, one of the activities that I've personally been involved in that uh, we are certainly very proud of. Thank, Thank you, Justin. Can I, can I open the floor? Would anybody like to pose a question for our panelists? You know, actually, um, Jamie, who's sitting three seats behind, uh, right here next to you, right, right across the <laughs> Actually, ja Jamie has put together an RFP, and and she and I will be interviewing companies this this coming week. So your question's very timely um, to to see if there are some opportunities and discounts for Highlands Ranch residents um, from some of these big solar companies. So so we're looking at that. Um, possibility of, of solar garden at some point. Um, we're investigating that and hopefully we can move forward on that. Um, and basically from a solar garden you can, uh, uh, instead of putting the solar panels on your own roof, you can actually uh, purchase or lease those solar panels for uh, in the solar garden. It's huge, huge. You would, you would have to be in a large area of land. but. So we're, we're looking at all those options. Solar panels have come down way in price over the last few years. And we do have some solar panels on our, at, at Eastridge and at Westridge on our, on our rec centers, but not, not a lot because the roof can't hold a whole lot of them. So did I answer anything? Yeah. Okay. Yes. David, I am wondering if you can talk a little bit about, you guys have been doing a lot of interviews with early residents like Susanna Ray and other people. I'm wondering if you can talk about some of the things you've learned from people who lived at or near the mansion in the early period. Is that a gotcha question? It wasn't meant to be. <laughs> it's a little bit of a gotcha question because I know the historical study we've been doing an awful lot of those. Yes. Uh, I have not watched most of them as in detail as I should, but at this point. <laughs> so, but well, I, what have you learned just talking? But to I've just learned talking to people just a lot of the early stories about how they lived out here, what it was like living and being out this far from Denver. It's a long way from Denver when you look at all the stuff that had to come out here, and there was a lot of distance and travel. And I think it back supplies you a little too. Yeah, get some of the supplies out a little too. Yeah, I know Mark is actually taking the video in the back is actually the one that did most of those and it would be better to answer most of these questions than I would, or at least that particular question. But that's okay. Yeah. Or have any of the rest of you met any early, early residents? Terry, have you met any early people? Early, early. Like Marvin Beeman or Marvin, I, I don't really, haven't really spent any time with him. Of course, I know I've not met him. I mean, ask Mark. The <laughs> an hour and a half. Now, uh, careful, this guy could talk about Marlon Beeman for 30 minutes. <laughs> okay, well, we'll turn this one into a promotion for the 
Islands Ranch Historical Society's website and also the Douglas County Library History Research Center's website as well, where they have a section on oral histories throughout the county, including a very few that we've done here for Highlands Ranch itself. So to answer the initial question, Sean, that you asked, what did we learn from some of the early residents more than we would have ever thought before? For example, the house south of the parking lot at the mansion property, referred to commonly as the Chum Howe House, was actually built by the Young family. Who was the Young family? Well, the oldest daughter of Elsie Phipps' first marriage was Mary. She married a guy named Chapman Young, and Elsie Phipps II gave them the land to build a house on the mansion property, but not in the mansion itself. Built of a double brick construction, ultimately he had some roots with the uh, Robinson brick, and Susanna Ray and her brothers and sisters lived there for probably the first 16 to 18 years of their life, roughly 1938 to 1954. About a year ago, the family arranged a private uh, tour of the mansion, they came in, and I was uh, privileged enough to videotape that along with help from Nancy uh, Winston Bigler. And Susanna poked her head into every outbuilding on the ranch property, and she had a story from each one. Like you wouldn't believe in an incredibly detailed memory. This is for somebody who uh, is in her 80s now. Marvin Beeman, I did an oral history with him oh, maybe six weeks ago. Marvin was born in Sedalia in 1932. That would make him about 83 now. Did you know that uh, Elsie Phipps built a little stone house for his family at what's now the Law Enforcement Training Center where he lived for many of the years of his life growing up. Did you know that he rode his horse to school in elementary school? There was a school just southwest of there. We learned that Marvin, his chief mentors were veterinarians who worked on uh, things on the, uh, the Phipps property. When Marvin went to college, L.P. Phipps II bought him three polo ponies. So he boarded three polo ponies at CSU, where he got his undergraduate and then eventually his, uh, his veterinary degree at this point. Marvin talks about most interesting vet cases when he worked at the ranch, including where he did a twin delivery once of twin, twin horses, one in 10,000. Happened on that one. Um, wonderful stories of the ranch and of Marvin's. I also did an interview with Jim Teffer. Uh, Jim Teffer, if ever any of you have been uh, by Veneford Ranch Road, there is a park named Teffer Park, named after him. Uh, he wanted it to be called Badger Park because he's the University of Wisconsin Badger Park. <laughs> I, I don't think that's going to happen. Anyway. But uh, Teffer had lots of stories about the mansion when they acquired it in 78. He and Lawrence Beeman talked of, Lawrence, excuse me, Lawrence Phipps III talked of lots of stories about the filming of the miniseries Centennial in 1978. Many of the scenes uh, were filmed at the mansion at this point, and some of the, uh, the controversy that occurred at that time, shall we say. Uh, Tepper had interesting stories of the condition of the mansion when they acquired it in 78 from the Phipps people. He likes to tell the stories of how in the two years from the time that Elsie Phipps died and the family decided to sell, the bees had taken over the mansion. So when you went inside the building, there was the overwhelming smell of honey because they had built their, their nest inside the walls. He talks about the, uh, the quality or lack thereof of the water on the storage facility up by the iconic windmill at this point. He thought it was undrinkable, so they had to bring bottled water in until they could clean that out and provide adequate water. Lots of different stories that these guys have. The Historical Society's website has it broken down into 
little five-minute stories that you might find interesting. I would encourage you to go look at those and listen to the ones that are of interest to you. If you want to hear the entire uh, interviews from <coughs> Susanna Ray, from Marvin Beeman, from Jim Tepper, go to the Douglas County Library's oral history section and look at the whole thing yourself. They're not, on, they're not only audio, but they're also video too, so you get some idea of who we're talking about when they're talking. Upcoming programs that the uh, Historical Society has includes a September program by Art Cook, who was the ranch foreman, if you will, brought out from California by Jim Teffer. In the September program and the October program, I believe, is that Jim Teffer will be coming and we'll be talking about the formation of the community that we live in today. Is that okay? That's perfect. Did that, did that answer your question? So we learned, we learned lots of different things about these early residents. Oh, Mark, why did you tell me you don't like to pu do public speaking? Because I don't. <laughs> it's, uh, it's really fascinating. You can, you can tap into an, an entirely different culture, an entirely different era of Highlands Ranch, and really see the uh, cultural evolution that's happening. Um, yeah, so. Is there another question? Yes, Nancy or Paul? We, we um, attended the Roxboro program, the same kind of a thing, and a major part of the Roxboro program was talking about water. And I know as residents we all get our, <coughs> our, our information on centennial water and all that, but could you just talk a little bit about the water and are we um, at in, in any shortage or do we have enough forever or what, what is the status of this? <laughs> That's a good question, and it's a good story about water in Highland Ranch, and uh, I'm happy to stand up here and talk about it. First off, let me point out something to you. Uh, your water bill says the Metro District at the top. You take every penny you send to us and give it to Centennial Water and Sanitation District. Who serves Highlands Ranch, they have nothing to do with the city of Centennial, just in case you're confused. The Water District got that name first, and then the city of Centennial came along after that. But the story about the water in Highlands Ranch is a terrific one. Um, you know, you have water, they have old-time water rights and lots of agreements for additional water. And the, the real story is that in the last 10 years, that, so that's when the community was really fairly well built out, 90% of the water came off the South Platte River, a renewable water source. Whereas there are other communities in, in Douglas County that are virtually 100% on aquifer water, groundwater. So they just dream about the day that they can get to 75% renewable. And the cost of water is going up rather significantly. Your water, your, your, uh, your water rates in Islands Ranch are kind of in the low third of areas in the vicinity. Um, they have a tremendous portfolio, and they are continuing to work on it. Concrete examples, South Platte Reservoir, some of you might have known it as the Keywet Gravel Pit. Everybody know where I'm talking about? North of Seaport 70, west of the South Platte River, there's a reservoir there. That entirely, that belongs entirely to Highlands Ranch. So that gives Centennial Water the opportunity to grab water when it's available, and sometimes this spring is a good example. South Platte River was free river, meaning anybody who had place to put it could take that water and store it and keep it, because all the downstream water rights had been met. So that's another that's an example of Centennial working to enhance that water portfolio. Additionally, they're a major player in the Chatfield reallocation. If you're not familiar with that, that's going to allow Chatfield water level to increase up to 12 feet deeper. A huge storage capability. They can do that without changing the dam itself. All they have to do is mitigate the impacts on the recreation facilities. So that project is proceeding and it will be another opportunity to store water that can be used here in Highlands Ranch. Is that enough? It's a great story here. And yes, your water future is secure in Highlands Ranch. Okay? Thank you. And 
our water quality, the quality of our water is good? It is. I mean, we, they have to go through all the required testing. It's governed by law, and, they, and we publish once a year. They publish once a year, Centennial. They're like brother, brothers to me, so we work in the same buildings. And they're really good people there. Anyway, every year they have to publish a water quality report, and it comes to every household, so you can read the details, and believe me, it's a pretty dry read. But the answer is yes. The quality is a dry read. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, the quality is as, as, as it should be. Yes. Well, uh, are, are they still getting a lot of water from deep water wells? It seemed like when I first came here, there was 12 deep water. Not here? No, no. no, like I said, 90% of the water in the last 10 years has come from the South Platte River. Hmm. Well, they, have, they haven't begun to use even a small percentage of the water that they're authorized to take out of the deep that's not the case in these other communities. Uh, Arthur, I was my bike along the plat Thursday and it was pretty high. Yeah. And uh, is that being let out of the reservoir, what we're seeing? Well, you know, the level in Chatfield is very high too because there's so much runoff coming. In fact, a lot of the recreation facilities are underwater yeah. or have been for the last several weeks. And uh, yeah, they have to spill quite a bit. That's one reason why it's running so. I mean, there was a good snowpack this year, and then it kept snowing in the spring, and then we got all that rain in May. <laughs> so, absolutely, the water is uh, an unbelievable water here. And California would love to have yeah. a year like that. Yeah. Yeah. So, that, that provides an opportunity to those who have a place to store it. That's why Chatfield reallocation is important. That's why the South Platte Reservoir is important. At one point, I heard that they were injecting water back into the ground. They're still doing that? Uh, not as much. Uh, this is called aquifer storage and recovery. Centennial has a number of wells. They have wells throughout Highlands Ranch that are able to tap water out of the aquifers. Many of them have the ability to pump it back down. So in extremely wet years, they can, pr they can treat the water, send it to those wells, and put it back down the hole. And that's one of the best ways to store it because you have no evaporation. The downside is that it costs money to pump it down. You have to pay for electricity to pump it down. So it's a cost-benefit analysis that they do. So they do some, not as much as they could, because it's expensive. You're in control of questions, please. <laughs> <laughs> Did you? No. Yes? I was wondering, this is for you. For um, Justin, does the Chamber of Commerce have any influence with Shea on the development of the commercial buildings? Um, I want to phrase this very carefully. I'm not sure any of us have a whole lot of influence on Shea necessarily. Um, <laughs> and, 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 and I mean that in a nice and respectful way in answer to your question. Uh, we have input. We've been invited to attend those discussions. We have attended those discussions. Uh, Shay, right now, and, and I think what you're talking about is the area out behind Target by the Children's Hospital, uh, because that's uh, the development that is currently underway. Uh, they had early on uh, indicated that, that the vision was similar to uh, for those who are familiar with uh, with the project in uh, Scottsdale, Arizona, was similar to Kierland. And what they wanted was a, a similar type of approach here. We've engaged them. We have discussed that with them. Uh, it's still proceeding along those types of, uh, of design schemes, which will be uh, subject to uh, the approval of the county. There's a hearing in front of the county on August 11th to decide on the, the zoning changes that they're requesting. I anticipate that will proceed, uh, but what they want to do is have some part that is uh, uh, commercial, a portion that is retail, a portion that is residential, uh, and the it's hard to compare it to something here, but, but Southland might be the closest comparison uh, in terms of what they're going to do, but it's really not uh, an accurate description of their intentions. It, it will include all of those 
provided the county approves it, and I anticipate that they will. Uh, and we've been fortunate to be part of those discussions, and uh, but it's proceeded as I think they had envisioned originally, for the most part. A lot of people talk about the fast food restaurants in the town center, and are wondering why there isn't a more uh, moderate, more <laughs> what is the word? Um, I will share with you if if that's something that you would like to launch, we will do everything possible to support you in that. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is kind of a follow-up question to that. Do you sure. know, and again, I'm hoping this isn't a gotcha question, um, do you know what percentage... Uh, not as much as I'm hoping this is. <laughs> do you know what percentage of businesses in Highlands Ranch are like locally controlled versus chains? Like. Is that, is that a percentage you can throw out? You, we, we haven't done that breakout. There are 2,000, roughly 2,000 businesses that are located in Highland Branch. Uh, obviously, a number of them are franchises. Right. So where you classify that right. in, in your question, I'm not sure. Uh, a, a number of them are service. It's largely service and retail, for the most part, uh, with the exception of, of a few significant employers. Uh, certainly, we're not going to see a lot of industrial manufacturing, and that's not what Highlands Ranch is. Uh, the, when Highlands Ranch was uh, originally designed uh, with Mission Viejo and then subsequently in uh, 97, and I turned to a historian, uh, in 97 with Shea Properties, uh, there was, out of the 22,000 acres that were designed, 1,000 acres were dedicated toward the, the business sector. So it's you know, that's, that's a small percentage of what Highlands Ranch is. In terms of the breakout of those 2,000 businesses, uh, how many are small, how many are big, I couldn't tell you. They employ approximately 19,000 uh, employees total uh, in Highlands Ranch. But uh, on any given work day, our population on average decreases by about 25,000 people. And that gives you an idea of how many people are working outside of the area. Highlands Ranch is the residential portion uh, the, 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 in that equation, uh, but really most of them, and the average commute for those employees is 25 and a half minutes. So we're seeing most people traveling uh, somewhere else, but most of those, uh, as we look at the surveys, have jobs that are professional occupations, that are managerial positions, uh, business owner positions, and so those are individuals who make a substantial income and are able to reside in Highlands Ranch because this is where they choose to live. Uh, that's, yeah, I know I've gone far astray from your question, so I'll, I'll defer to the next question. Does anyone else like to, would like to add anything? I can add some more. So uh, that area that Justin was talking about is uh, right here on your map, right above the A and the N and Highlands Ranch, right in the middle, if you want to look at that. So north of uh, Target, south of Lucent, uh, there will be a new light rail station someday. I'm not sure when that occurs. That goes in on the west side of Lucent and the north side of Plaza. So that's a factor in that development. Uh, the Metro District will have a role in infrastructure, possibly a commons park, if you will, in the new business park development, possibly an ice rink, and uh, also possibly there might be a joint government building that some of us might be tenants in. You said a lot of possibles there, none of that's definite. Uh, all they're doing right now, like, like you said, is going to rezoning and we'll see. You should see something in the next couple of years though. You should see some kind of development occur there. So, yeah. Both. There'll be some, there'll be high density, um, some attached, hopefully owner occupied, and some rental as well. <coughs> And some, I think there'll be some single family, but dense. More like spaces, not necessarily just like spaces. 
more like brown brownstones right here, and then also some apartments. That's my understanding of it. Shea is a better organization to answer that. Okay, thank you, Gary. Uh, yes, in the, in the back. You know, actually, you got me thinking when you when you mentioned that the so much of the population in Highlands Ranch leaves during the workday and comes back, and that seems to be something that is an identifying characteristic of the community that shapes the decisions that are made about how the community develops, if that makes sense. And I'm wondering if anybody else on the panel or yourself would be able to speak to some of the other things that are really defining characteristics of Highlands Ranch that do influence future developments or how <laughs> developments have occurred milestone ones in the past. I'll address some of that. And, and as I understand the question, the question is what is the current composition of Highlands Ranch uh, such that it, we can project into the future these are decisions that are likely to, to be needed or issues that will be likely to address? In a certain way, I think in terms of like, so what is the big influence on Pittsburgh? Steel and Carnegie's money, right? Those kind of things. What are those kind of things here in Highlands huh. Ranch? We have, um, well, Highlands Ranch, and it's interesting, we are a, a, a census-designated place. That's the legal term. Um, we are not an incorporated municipality. And, uh, you know, for the most part, uh, I think people are grateful for that. Uh, but we have a population that has now crested 100,000. Uh, in the last census, we were at 96. The, the understanding is that we're now over 100. The uh, homes, uh, we rank uh, out of, in, when we are comparing us <coughs> to cities that are 50,000 above, <coughs> Uh, we rank number one in newest home development. Okay, so we have we have the newest homes out of cities that would be 50,000 or more. We rank number seventh in largest homes. Okay, in the country, one of the reasons clearly is that 48 percent of uh, the homes that we have uh, have minor children, and so we see that we have in the master plan, in the development of this community, it is largely uh, family-based. Okay? Parks, or schools, the size of our homes. Uh, it is also uh, based upon a certain income level. So we have an average, the median income for Highlands Ranch is, uh, under the last uh, statistics, 108,000. Now that is almost double the state average of 58,000. Uh, as a average income for household. So when, when we're looking at the composition, there are a few things that I think are going to happen moving forward. Number one, it is, uh, you know, now that it has been created, and, and there are a few things left, and we've talked about those, but now that it has been largely created, how do we sustain that? Okay, with other developments coming up in other areas, with other, uh, other uh, housing projects being built, we know what they are, uh, how do we sustain that? And I will share with you that the Chamber of Commerce, uh, HRCA, the Metro District uh, have engaged in a uh, joint effort. I have to defer because it is, uh, I think, more so HRCA and more so Metro District. They were gracious to include us in that process. Uh, but a, a, a marketing effort that is a rebranding of Highlands Ranch uh, that is intended to perpetuate both the, uh, the, the understanding of the lifestyle that you have here and the quality of life because of the attractiveness of bringing in people who do have the income and are able to contribute back to the community. So that is underway. We've already gone through uh, a couple of significant stages and, and that is proceeding. We see wonderful marketing materials that have come out of that uh, and, and, and will continue to do so. The other thing that's projected is that our population, as it currently exists, is going to get older. Mm -hmm. Now, how much that, uh, how, how much those statistics are true, I think really depends on two factors. Number one, yes, our current population will get older. That goes without saying, I think that's self-evident. But the projections are that we're going to be somewhere around, right now we're at 6% uh, of a population that is 65 or above. The projection is that, I think within the, the next 15 years it is, 
that we will be in the 20 to 30 percent range of people who are 65 and above. Now, if that is true, then we need to retool and, and provide a lot of services uh, beyond just what we see right now. And, and, and what we see right now in terms of fee, in terms of um, Erickson's place. Windcrest. Windcrest, thank you. In terms of Windcrest, and they have, I mean, they have so much expansion going on there, and we all know that. So we may be looking at the need for significant programs. Now, add that to the fact that, as I just said, we are seventh in the nation in terms of the size of our homes, and we're, we're, we're largely family-based. I, for one, you know, when I get to that point, I'm going to be looking to downsize. Now, to what extent can we downsize in Highlands Ranch? Our options are somewhat limited. So, to, yes, there is a prediction that the age will increase, but my prediction is, at the same time, there will be people looking to downsize who, who as they get to that age, will be moving outside the community, and young families will be moving into the community. But that is an issue we have to pay very close attention to. Um, the... And we, We've already talked about the remaining development that's that's going on that's underway in the next few years. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Maybe too much. In one facet. No, absolutely. Thank you. Ch change of subject. Yes. Yes. Uh, in James Mitchner's book, he mentioned something called the chalk cliffs. Does anyone know where that is? The chalk. It was it the chalk cliffs? Chalk. Chalk. Like, on the you notice I'm holding the microphone out. <laughs> I, I, don't I, don't I don't know the answer, but I don't know. First off, I read the book. I love the book. The book is centennial. It's long, but it's really good. I thought it was up by Greeley somewhere. Yeah. What, where? Greeley. Like Greeley. Like Greeley. Am I right? Yeah. Yeah. I think it's yeah. yeah, which direction from Green? Uh, <laughs> don't quote me on that. I think that's where. I, that's when I read the book. That's where I got the picture that it was. Well, you would have a better uh, understanding. No, no, I wouldn't probably. <laughs> All right. Yes, in the back. Looking forward, one of the problems in terms of quality of life about Highlands Ranch, particularly at rush hour is the C-470 situation. I'm sure that a lot of governmental entities are involved in addressing this in terms of a coalition task force. Can someone talk about what's being done about the transportation situation in Highlands Ranch, particularly at the northern end in the C-470 corridor? Thanks for the question, Mark. Um, first off, uh, Isles Ranch is a master plan community, so we knew what it was going to look like when we're done at the very beginning. And it's my opinion that the roads are sized appropriately to handle the traffic, the ultimate build-out traffic, within the ranch. Now, C-470 has become congested, and there was a coalition really put together by Douglas County. The Metro District participated in that through elected officials as well as staff, and we continue to. Uh, that's a CDOT project. It's going to proceed. It's going to be a toll road. The additional lanes, they'll, re they'll retain the two no-cost lanes. <coughs> Additionally, they're going to have, uh, for example, if you get on at Broadway, the, that on-ramp will just continue all the way to University. And every place they could, not all the way from University of Quebec, that's too far, but all those in-betweens will have that on-off on, lane will go all the way. So it's like an additional lane there as well. Um, you should see construction within two years, I think, starting. Um, beyond that. Chalk Cliffs are in Chaffee County near Buena Vista. Well, I was Near close. Near <laughs> 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 but I had somebody agreeing with me. Near <laughs> 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 Buena Vista. Near Mount Princeton. Chaffee County. The white cliffs of Dover in England are chalky too. <laughs> 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 These ones are close. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to ask just a real quick question. I think, I don't know if uh, Ken, you might be willing to answer this or. Uh, with new developments in terms of um, transportation, uh, uh, food industry discussions, and anything, anything like that, 
what are going to be some of the information, the best information resources for um, getting the, the updates on that type of information and getting it out to the community? Yeah. Let Jamie answer that. Yeah, you know, our, our uh, community relations department does a great job with that. And, and between our newsletter, um, e blasts, uh, Facebook, Twitter, uh, you know, all, all of the different types of media, I think, I think there's plenty of information there. Um, people can come to our website, they can also just call us and, and we can route you to the, to the right individuals that can answer those questions for you. Um, yes. Um, someone mentioned incorporation and without going into great detail and giving us a master's degree, what are the advantages of not being an incorporated town like Parker or Lone Tree? Why, why is that better for, for some people to believe it is? So, answer this question. What is it you're missing that you want to pay another $500 a year for? <laughs> I mean, uh, the last time it was seriously looked at was in 1999 by the HRCA. They formed a committee, a citizen committee, and they concluded that it was feasible to incorporate in Highlands Ranch with about a 3 to 3.5% three increase in sales tax and a little bit of an increase in property tax. Um, one, of the thing, one of the reasons why communities incorporate is they're not satisfied with the services. And another one is they're worried about their future. What's it going to look like? in the end, and where are we going to have additional development? We have a couple of advantages there, I think. And this is Terry speaking, not the Metro District, please. Okay. Um, we know we're a master plan community. We know what it's going to look like when we're done. In fact, we're almost there, except for the business park development, really. Um, and I believe, in combination with the community association, this, the library, Douglas County, we, I think we have outstanding services here. That's just me speaking. Um, so, and our taxes are lower. I'll, I'll just tell you a story. I was at the uh, uh, at, a, at a meeting, and sitting next to me was the city manager of the city of Lone Tree, and we got the discussion got on to the property taxes. As you know, there's a very significant increase in your property values, and that affects property taxes. And we got into discussion on that. And I said, Yeah, and our property, our total property tax mill levy is 96 point something in Islands Ranch, and he said, Oh, really? And he gets online while we're sitting there, and he looks up his in Lone Tree, and his was 97 point something. Plus, they have an additional, I think, 1.8% sales tax in Lone Tree. So, and our neighbors to the north have about, I think their uh, sales tax is over 8%. I know it is in Parker. I suspect it is in Castle Rock. Now, if you live in downtown Castle Rock, you have almost no property tax. But if you live in some of the outlying communities, the Meadows, they have metro districts, and we all have the school district, of course. So, I don't know if, I guess the answer is, what is it you're missing that you want to pay more? It, sales tax, people think it's kind of free money because other folks are going to come to town and spend their dollars and you take sales tax on that. But if you buy a car, they determine how much sales tax you pay based on where you live. If you remodel, that's what, if you buy a sofa, wherever. Thank you. That's really. I just was curious. Thank you. You're welcome. Yes. We're not designed to be a tourist destination, so it's our tax dollars. <laughs> yeah, there's not that much out retail where people come here to buy. It's not like Park Meadows, for example. Where... Well, I, I think I'm right. You, you don't have a police force. You're, you're protected by the Douglas County Sheriff's Department. See, that's a savings. Littleton has a police department. Castle Rock has a police department. You've got all those additional expenses, which uh, I assume uh, Highland France doesn't have. Well, we're served by Douglas County Sheriff. That's Sheriff. absolutely true. And I don't think anybody feels that uh, they probably need a police force. I think they do an outstanding job. Yeah. <laughs> Yes. 
not good with someone when you pull this, you know, you break a knee or something. <laughs> what is the question? Oh, is there any kind of senior housing besides Windcrest plan? You know, that we have to buy in you know, mm -hmm. apartments or condos that would be one floor. Uh, well, we have, we have Windcrest, we have the, we have uh, a few. Corona, the retreat. The we have Brookdale for those who, who need that level of service. Um, I, I'm not aware of any that are currently in the works, that, that are currently planned to develop, but Wingcrest keeps expanding like crazy. I don't know how much more land they have. Maybe, maybe somebody else on the panel is aware Wind, of that. Wingcrest, uh, to build. Wingcrest, you need a pretty uh, good income to you know, get in there. There's a lot of people who probably couldn't afford it. You, you need to have a pretty good income to get, go a number of places in Highlands Ranch. But, <laughs> um, but uh, you know, they're, I, I find them pretty approachable. I don't, I, I, I've talked with them from time to time. I don't know what their current rates are. Right. Uh, I, I don't know. I know they are doing just a wonderful job in providing great services. I hear very little that's negative about them. I actually can't think of anything. I, I have a lot of friends there, and they, they like it. Yeah. I, I do as well. There's a development over by Sky Ridge that's being built that's for seniors also. Right? That's one yeah. um, we don't get to take credit for that. <laughs> <laughs> I just thought I'd mention that. But it's in the um, I have a question for Ken. Now, First, I'd like to thank Jamie. She does a wonderful job with all the activities and everything. And of course, Metro District does also, as well as um, HRCA. Um, the backcountry, do you want to speak a little bit about the development in the backcountry? Sure. Um, backcountry is about 8,200 acres, and it's just south of Highlands Ranch. Wow. Oh, I'm sorry. Backcountry is about 8,200 acres south of Highlands Ranch. It's, it's there for all the residents. We have a number of hiking trails there, and we're developing a number of uh, fun programs, too, for, for kids, for, for uh, horseback riding, for horseback riding, and hay rides, uh, you, you name it. We, we keep adding programs each year, too. So uh, uh, we've expanded our staff by a couple people this last year, and uh, it's just a wonderful, uh, undeveloped area uh, south of here that most people don't really realize. What's, what's the access for the getting into the horseback riding? Um, I believe the horseback riding is off of Griggs Road, and uh, yeah, off of, uh, off of Griggs and uh, Griggs. Yeah, and and uh, um, you could go online, uh, you know, on our website. And, and uh, click on the backcountry, and it'll, it'll give you all the information uh, concerning the horseback riding. It's, it's a seasonal deal. It's usually just in the summertime is when we run the horseback riding. Makes sense. Are the homes in backcountry going to go down like the east? Yeah, I'm not sure. Um, and, and that's not really related to our backcountry. Our backcountry is strictly open space, yeah. and then there's the backcountry, uh, you know, neighborhood. And I, I know it's uh, from what I've seen, it keeps expanding, um, kind of to the west there, or the east. Sorry. It's gonna it's gonna go right up to the gulch that's on the other side, that separates that development from high school. <coughs> Yes. I have a two-part question. Occasionally we see cattle <clears throat> when we drive south on Monarch or Griggs Road or any of those other places. Could someone talk about the status of the ranching lease with the district or with Shea um, with emphasis to what might happen beyond 2020? You know, um, I, I personally don't work with that and I'm not up to speed on, on the lease. I, I believe it's been renegotiated here recently, 
and I'm not sure that it's a long-term lease either. So, so I wish I could answer your question, but I just don't have those that information. I can help a little bit, maybe. Um, first, you need to understand that uh, agriculture in Highlands Ranch uh, is important to the developer. You probably didn't realize that acreage that's used for ag purposes is taxed at a much lower rate than development acreage. Thus, they keep their undeveloped land. They have to graze cattle or horses there so often, every so often, in order to keep that ag destination. That's the basis for the whole ranching operation at the here in Highlands Ranch, and that's with Shea. I know they also contract with HRCA because they do graze cattle in the backcountry, which the HRCA owns, backcountry wilderness area. Um, also, we own a portion of the future historic park, the portion that's kind of the northwest portion, including the mansion. There's another 200 acres that Shea still retains ownership of, and they run their ranching operation in a contract with Clef Cattle Company out of that property. Someday we will own that. Someday we intend to have some sort of ranching operation um, there to as part of the heritage of the community. Does that help some? You know, we're just, we're just in the um, beginning stages of investigating um, the solar farm and the feasibility for us. Uh, the, the only open land that we have is in the back country. You know, and there are definitely on the east side, uh, uh, as you drive towards Castle Pines North, um, there, there's some major power lines and we probably not want to put it in any area uh, that, that would uh, hurt the open space at all or, or degrade it, but, but uh, put it near those power lines somewhere. Mm -hmm. Yes? At what point will uh, Highlands Ranch be built out, uh, anticipated being totally built out, and uh, what's the anticipated population at that time? Mm -hmm. I'll give you my version, and then maybe one of these other fellows has something. Um, we're almost built out in residential. The only thing left is remaining lots in backcountry. Um, and then the residential that's being asked to be rezoned in the business park. If you will, in a little bit right over here, you see some buildings under construction right here in the town center. That's it, residential. And then commercial lags part of the plan, it just takes a while before you, and there's still probably 25% of commercial land in Highlands Ranch yet to be developed. Your guess is as good as mine how long it'll take for that to all develop. But, like I said earlier, within the next couple of years you're probably going to see some activity uh, in that big chunk just south of the Lucent buildings there. So, is that, that's about as good as I can do. Anticipated population? Well, it's really, you know, people get that, if you look at the census, they had it wrong because they include all, included all the province center as part of Highlands Ranch. That's not really part of Highlands Ranch. If you know where that is, that's east of Colorado Boulevard. There's that square of homes in there. That, that's not part of Highlands Ranch, and they include that. So we're really about 93, 94,000, and we're not going to get much above 95 or 6. Some people say 100. Depends on how many kids move out and get jobs. <laughs> or stay at home. <laughs> so this may be a really weird, wacky question. I'll just throw that to everybody. It's probably HRCA though. So say in 25 years, everybody decides we should put solar panels on our houses. How would that process happen? Because I know it can happen now, right? <coughs> With their with the uh, covenants and stuff, how would people go about changing something? No, like that no, people to... can put solar panels oh, on their okay. roofs right now. So, so that's not an issue at all. Okay. Yes. How is that property that Shea gave so 
the Highlands Ranch for the mansion and the park and all that as it transfers from perhaps a cattle lease or cattle operation to whatever Highlands Ranch can do with that property. Um, let me start by saying, you know, I'm a big fan of Shea. I think you cannot find a better developer, in my opinion. And, and I've worked with them for a long time. They have no control over me. That's not a paid political announcement. <laughs> They're just a great developer. 60% of this community is going to be non-urban uses when we're done. 60% is open space, parks, trails, yeah, schools. So they've given a tremendous amount. All the school sites they gave, all the parks they gave, all the open space. We have 2,250 acres of open space in and amongst your homes. They have 8,200 acres, which uh, was given uh, as all the school sites. And then uh, I mentioned that we'll own 250 acres in the historic park around the mansion. It's going to be owned by the Metro District, and we're going to pay zero tax because we're a government. <laughs> oh, okay, that's what I didn't know. Yes. So that, that, that we don't have any tax incentive to do anything different. No, it's, it's, deed, it's deed restricted yeah. such that it can't be developed. Okay. Well, that's and, and, and your government has no intention of developing any of our property. We can't really. Legally, we can't. They've been, they were required, that the developer was required in day one back in 1978 by the county to deed a certain amount of open space and those other uses uh, as part of the development. So, so, so I guess my, my question, and now I'm figuring out what I want to know, is this is a sustainable model that we have going forward as is. Is, yeah. is it or is it not? It Absolutely. Uh, from sustainable um, it depends on what you mean by that. I, I will comment on this. Um, the Metro District is funded by property and we have, you also get an increase in the amount that you can collect based on growth. And we've been growing in this community ever since I've been here. Well, we're facing the end of that. And it's just the nature, and I can happily go into details with you about what Tabor does to property taxes over time. But it, in essence, we are able to adjust um, property taxes every two years when you get your reassessment, you just got one, and we're allowed to increase our revenues by one year's worth of CPI. So our costs will go up two years worth, if you will. The cost of doing business goes up every year, and we're able to recapture one year of every two on Tabor. So we anticipate someday Quite a bit in the future, our current model says about 2024, where we might have to come to the voters and seek so either, either an exemption from that restriction on Tabor or an increase in the mill levy in order to maintain current services. The alternative being we might have to reduce the service level. But that's quite a ways out. It's just a forecast. So sustainable? Yes, I mean, this community is in great shape. Great water portfolio. The district is very strong financially right now. Um, I, I don't know if that's what you meant by sustainable. But there, we know what it's going to look like when it's done. We're almost done. So, okay. Yes. Hi. I have a question. It may not even apply to you, but is there ever going to be a light rail extension to Highlands Ranch? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> take, your, take your picture out. And the, the picture is referring to, I think there's, um, mm -hmm. there's sort of. Huh? So this is sort of. Sort of, yeah. There's a handful over here from black only. So the voters in our RTD approved fast tracks 12 years ago, something like that. Yeah. And it was supposed to build this complete system throughout the Denver metro area. And then they came back a few years later and said, ah, we don't have enough money to do that. We were supposed to have our light rail extension in Islands Ranch in 2017, according to the fast tracks. Now it's like 2042. 
<laughs> Hang in there. <laughs> Don't wait for the bus to get to work. To the train to get down. <laughs> That being said, uh, a similar circumstance was uh, you know, to occur in Longtree, but Longtree partnered with Douglas County and I can't remember who else, and came up with some money, and they're proceeding with the extension down I-25. Uh, there's a possibility that could happen here too. That's all I'll say on that. I don't know how likely that is, but the Metro District might partner with Douglas County and others too. Extended. It's going to go, if you see Blakeland written there, everybody find that on there? Just to the right of the D in Blakeland, on the north side of Plaza there, it's near Children's Hospital. Yeah. It's where the terminus of the southwest light rail. Okay? All right. Um, I'd like to spend just maybe the last five or ten minutes uh, whether some last comments, uh, maybe another question or two, if you, if, if you have one, or if the panelists would like to cover something that uh, we may have missed in the process. All right. I have some. Yes. I know I've been talking too much. No, no. So the Metro District Board has a number of priorities, and uh, I just want to talk about the number one priority for them, and that's fire and emergency services. You see the fire trucks, and they say Littleton on them, and you, know, you wonder about that. Well, we contract with the city of Littleton for fire and emergency services. We think it's a great partnership. They're a world-class fire department, and because we're bigger as partners, we get it more efficiently. That being said, the number one priority of the board is to look at ways to enhance fire and emergency services. And I believe you're going to see some of those enhancements beginning in next year, 2016. We intend to bu budget for enhanced services. The whole goal is to get response times down as low as you can reasonably get them. Now, it's kind of an exponential curve, so there's a balance between how much you spend for it and how much you get. And Highlands Ranch is a kind of a unique challenge for fire and emergency services. We have over 800 cul-de-sacs in this community. Yeah. Travel time is a challenge for us on our fire department here, uh, just because of that. And not only that, they have eight streets with the same name. It's just place, way, street, drive, <laughs> lane, whatever. And I, I don't know how those firefighters do it. They have a computer, but... But anyway, so we have some challenges because of the way the community is laid out in response time. We intend to add resources with our partners uh, in Littleton Fire to improve your fire and emergency services. That's all. Well, driving here, um, you, one of the things I really enjoy about coming up to Highlands Ranch is it's, you always see an active community. And uh, I saw a pool full of families. I saw a golf course full of golf players and a library with a parking lot that is entirely full. So um, this is a wonderful community. And uh, I'd like to give a last final round of applause for these community leaders. Thank you for coming. Please have a cookie if you'd like to on your way out. <laughs>